has happened The love has taken hold And won't let go of us now Something here is calling us forward, upward motion with drops in one ocean. Roll on. Will you rise up with me today? Lift up your voice and boldly say, We are the ones we've been waiting for. Good evening and welcome everyone. We're really very pleased to be able to bring you this special AGNT Leadership Forum tonight because our guest is the Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith from the Agape International <laughs> Spiritual Center. And we have everyone wants to attend this webinar, including all of our pets and animals. So um, we see that we have many more people uh, signed up for the webinar tonight and for those who have not been able to make it in real time we will <laughs> this is crazy he, may, he never comes out and now he because Michael's here he can't just he can't get it up um, those of you who would like to watch the recording you'll get a notification about where to find that tomorrow so um, let's start right away because this is a special program tonight and I'm going to ask my regular co-host, Stephen Pope, to introduce Michael Beckwith. For those of you who don't know him, however, I would say you were really missing out if that was the case. But let's introduce you to Michael again. It's a thrill. I'm happy to uh, introduce Dr. Beckwith. Uh, he's, Michael Bernard Beckwith is the president of the Association for Global New Thought, as most of you know and founder and spiritual director of the Agape International Spiritual Center, a trans-denominational community headquartered in Los Angeles that is comprised of thousands of local members and global live streamers. Dr. Beckwith embraces a practical approach to spirituality, utilizing meditation, affirmative prayer, and life visioning, a process he originated. These practices teach us to take the experience of inner peace and awakened awareness into our everyday lives. In 2012, Dr. Beckwith addressed the UN General Assembly uh, during its annual World Interfaith Harmony Week. As co-founder and president of the Association for Global New Thought, he hosts conferences featuring harbingers of world peace, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the distinguished honor and had the distinguished honor of presenting to Nelson Mandela the Gandhi King Award. Dr. Beckwith is a sought after meditation teacher, conference speaker, and seminar leader in the life visioning process. Three of his most recent books, Life Visioning, Spiritual Liberation, and Transcendence Expanded, are recipients of the prestigious Nautilus Award. He has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Network's Super Soul Sunday, Super Soul Sessions and Help Desk, Dr. Oz, CNN, The Oprah Show, Larry King Live, Tavis Smiley, and his own PBS special, The Answer Is You. And he's also a member of Oprah's prestigious inaugural Super Soul 100. Every Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, thousands tune into his radio show on the Los Angeles Pacifica station, KPFK, that is called Wake Up, The Sound of Transformation. So I'm looking for So Michael. Hey Barbara. We usually we usually start off these programs with a blessing. And tonight you get to do the honors. So Thank would you. you please begin? Yeah, absolutely. We just uh, stop right where we are and turn within and get a real sense that where we are is at the very center of the mind of the infinite, the center that's everywhere. The circumference that is nowhere. We feel such a deep sense of gratitude to be awake, aware, and alive that our ability to see the presence, which is never an absence, is enhanced. And unifying with this presence, the very word that's being spoken is its law. 
naming these precious moments together insightful, the rising up of spiritual camaraderie, joyful, as we become harbingers of the activation of our highest potentiality on earth as it is in the mind of the infinite. We name these moments one and we let it be. Amen. Thank you. It looks as if we have a second connection that was responsible for the noise. So I am, um, okay, here we go. Um, so the subject of ag ts live webinar with Michael tonight is exploring the big questions. And that is because with unprecedented levels of stimuli, and information streaming at us from every direction, sorting out what's true, what matters, and especially what is ours to do can be a tumultuous task. We thought it might be a good idea to take a step back and inward, to explore the backdrop to how we empower ourselves to respond to the current day crises and opportunities. So the way we're gonna do that tonight is to offer you an in-depth understanding of Michael's life visioning process and offer you a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to engage with him in a personal dialogue around these questions. And that is a very rare opportunity. So I hope that you'll all participate as much as possible. So I'm gonna start with the first one, Michael. Uh, the question, what is the universe trying to emerge through my life? And the first thing I'd like to do is ask you to explain that a little more. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I'm happy to be with you, the executive director of the Association for Global New Thought and all the, the wonderful work you do for the organization, for the people who are tied into it. And I appreciate what you said about how we're bombarded constantly with uh, errant thoughts. Uh, some of the thoughts I say come from the sea of mental garbage the thoughts that are emanating from uh, the sense of separation that humanity is suffering from. And those thoughts creates, they creates a kind of a milieu of fear and doubt and worry and anxiety and anxiousness. And so one of the ways that we can begin to, to listen and hear uh, spiritually is to come to an understanding that our perception is often uh, created by the questions we ask ourselves. And so the, uh, the uninitiated, the individuals that are not necessarily having a spiritual practice or a spiritual intention, they have the tendency to ask disempowering questions. They'll live in the, the, the vibration of what's wrong, who's to blame, why me, this type of thing. When in truth, as a composite spiritual idea, each of us carry the whole of the presence, for the presence is everywhere according to our, our unique pattern. And so when we begin to ask empowering questions, like what, what's trying to emerge through me, um, we begin to set ourselves up to incline our ear, to lowly listen, to hear, which really trying to emerge through us. As, as you know, each being uh, is a unique expression of, of infinity. Uh, each being carries, there's nothing missing in us spiritually. And so when we ask that kind of question, we start to listen to and activate um, those particular qualities that come forward. Now, what's important is that people understand that we're all unique, that, that this presence that is infinite doesn't do do-overs and it doesn't make mistakes and it doesn't repeat itself. So everyone is a unique expression of the infinite. So we don't have to create our uniqueness. There are people who try to do that and they become bizarre personalities <laughs> because they're trying to create something that already exists. And so by turning within and getting a sense of our connection with the presence as a unique being, and then we ask a question. Now here's the deal. The universe lawfully will answer any question that you ask. So if you live in the question of what's wrong or what's wrong with me, uh, Lawfully, the universe will mine the database of human consciousness and find something that matches you. You know, somebody left you, uh, your parents got divorced, or you had some kind of issue when you were a kid, and basically give you a reason 
for what's, what's going on in your life that would ultimately become an excuse. But if you ask, what's emerge through me? That takes you to a higher level. It doesn't discount that bad things uh, may have happened to you or you may have experienced certain things in your life. But now you're on a trajectory of hearing a message that's streaming everywhere throughout all creation about your potential. And as you begin to listen and, and begin to hear, what you're doing is you are spiritualizing or activating a spiritual faculty called hearing. Now, here's the deal. I know I'm at taking a long time to answer this question, but I think this is very important. Um, there's a statement by a, a, a teacher uh, by the name of Jesus the Christ that says they have eyes, but they see not, and they have ears, but they hear not. And what he's speaking to is that people have eyes, but all they only see are their own thoughts about reality. And they have ears, but the only thing they hear are their own inner conversations with those thoughts. So they have eyes and ears, but they're only seeing their own perception about reality, not having a clear encounter with reality, which as we teach in New Thought is a, is a presence that's never an absence. So by asking an empowering question, you're starting to uh, clear up and activate your ability to, to hear and see, not with the ears, not with the eyes, but with consciousness. You start to get intuitive hits, guidance, and becoming dreams, little insights, little nudges along the way. And keep in mind, this is always happening. But because we haven't been asking or listening, it just kind of flows through us. We don't have any relationship to it. We have more relationship uh, to our limited perception and our thoughts about reality. So that question, what's trying to emerge through me? Very big question that one should take on on a regular basis so that they're not being guided uh, by the, the stimuli of past thinkingness, but they're being guided uh, by the presence that's always pulling us to express our potential. Yeah, I was hoping that you'd explain that in depth because what I'd really like to do now is ask the attendees of which there are quite a few tonight, um, if you would like to be brought onto the screen with audio and or video and answer that question that Michael just asked, what is the universe trying to emerge through my life? And have a little dialogue with us. Um, as I said before, this is a rare opportunity to get some up close and personal feedback about this very important process. So in order to prepare for that, and you can raise your hand and I will bring you onto the screen. It's, it should be a, you know, it won't be a long, we're not looking for long answers. Um, but let's begin by asking this question. Um, and I'm taking this directly from Michael's visioning process. Close your eyes and ask yourself the question, what is the universe trying to emerge through my life? And then just listen to the ear behind your ear for the answer. Allow the universe to speak through you. Again, the answers that come in are to be based on what you receive as your own answers. So let's just take a moment and then we'll begin. Okay, thanks. So one of our first volunteers who'd like to talk with Michael tonight is someone that he knows, Alana Leah, or Lee, is that the pronunciation? I'm gonna bring you onto the screen. Hello. Hi, Alana. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> hey, Alana, how are you? Hi, Rav, wonderful, really great. So the answer to this question, you partially know already. 
Um, I have spent the last couple of weeks with French dignitaries who came for the climate change conference. And when I had asked before accompanying them for the week, what is mine to do? It's almost like a waterfall came every day that continues. We're in daily correspondence now, even that they're back in France, because I realized what is mine to do in this moment is to create a positive, uplifting part participation from the United States about the Paris Climate Accord. Because I was at the international conference last year when the US pulled out, it was a really uh, disheartening moment. And so to work with these people who were a part of that initial agreement and demonstrate to them that there are Americans who are fully on board and we're finding every day new things that we can do, it's, it's been one of the most incredible processes over the last couple of weeks. This communication and it's like we're in sync across time zones. There are other people who were involved in this process, you know, Finney and Make Peace from Kiss the Ground. Right. And it's like we're all in sync at the same time on the same wavelength. So I'm just basically saying how beautiful this process is and far beyond anything I would have imagined when we started planting trees. I never right. knew it could lead to this. Well, you know, just taking you as an example, when you began to ask that question years ago, yeah. And, and, and what, what, what emerged through you was the possibility of Mother Earth uh, being taken care of in a very beautiful way, that we have enough trees on the planet to have enough uh, oxygen so that the human beings could survive on it. And then that subsequently led you to particular um, efforts such as you're doing now with climate change, the people you're meeting, the ways that you're affecting consciousness. So at, at, the, at the meta level, you saw Mother Earth flourishing, and then your and that, that that was a vision you had, and then your mission was to actually work within uh, the human dynamic to bring about a planting of trees. How many trees have you planted thus far? Six thousand, yeah. but ours all really grow. Yeah. <laughs> They're not just yeah. numbers. They're yeah. growing. Big yeah, you have six thousand trees, and we've yeah. been part of that at Agape. Yeah, that are actually growing. You've influenced consciousness. You're meeting with dignitaries. So your mission is increasing because you're living in a big question. Mm -hmm. And the question is not, um, what's, what's beautiful about this is that many people live in the victim consciousness about all the things that are going wrong in the world. You know, our, our rain forces are disappearing really fast. Pollution is invading our environment. The ozone layer is disappearing. Pollution is going into the ocean. And you could, you could, you could have stayed there and just ranted about how bad things are. But instead, you asked a larger question, what is it that's trying to emerge through me? Mm -hmm. And then now that has led you to the planting of trees, the educating of people, working with dignitaries around the world. And so you've come out of any sense of victimization without denying that there are real problems and real issues that we have to face. But the, the question has led you to action. Yeah. Seeing a vision, engaged conversation, and then real action. And so I, I applaud you um, for taking those steps because everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. Right. And you have found your something. Yeah. Yeah. So thank, thank, you. thank you so much, Alana. Yeah. I'm going thank to you. put you back into the queue. And I think that we should take one more and then move on to the next question. So I'm going to ask Julie Saunders to come and speak with us for a moment. Hi, Julie. Julie, are you here? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey. How do you answer that question? Well, it was very interesting. Um, what came up for me is a new path of service using my skills to help people navigating cancer mm. with more complementary treatments. I am currently navigating my own personal path. And what I've realized is that so many people are not even offered the options 
that are available. And I'm stunned that conventional doctors are not the people who still do not offer things. For example, what I'm finding is helping me the most is Chinese medicine and acupuncture, mm -hmm. a radical change in diet. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you when I go for chemo treatment, I talk to my chemo sabis, as I call them. <laughs> and, um, and most people have never even considered these options. And I, I'm blessed that I'm moving through this very well. But I, that's, that's what's kind of coming out for me. I don't know exactly what that looks like. And I'm realizing that this visioning could really, really help me mm. in discovering that's, that. Yeah, that's very powerful, Julie. You, you have found what is yours to do. And by stepping into the frequency of service, which is one of the highest dynamics that we can come into as we wake up in this human incarnation is to be in service to each other. That, that leads to higher and higher states of, of, of um, the mystical marriage with, with the presence. And so you, have, you see a need and you're filling it. So again, at the meta level, you're seeing individuals being uh, uh, healed or you're seeing the revelation of wholeness in, in beings. But now you, uh, part of your mission is to inform people that there are other ways that might be beneficial for the individuals rather than uh, the simple cookie cutter AMA way that may not take in consideration nutrition or hydration or uh, organic vitamin C or selenium or Chinese medicine or acupuncture or so many other modalities mm -hmm. that seek to um, uh, allow for the immune system to expand the body temple to become uh, more regenerative uh, rather than just killing cancer you uh, so you found yours to do through this through this asking this question and now if you as you stay in the question longer what happens is you bring into your life more resources more people more information that you presently and you, that, you, that you presently have just being in that field, you, things will be uncovered for you and you'll start to provide a, probably a really great resource book for people who are going through this from uh, support groups all the way to alternative ways of healing. And I think it's also interesting to note that what we call alternative, you know, based at the beginning of the year 2000, more people were doing alternative medicine, so-called alternative, than regular medicine so people are waking up and so you are of course now uh, being a pioneer and bringing this information to people at a much more rapid pace so again uh, we, we applaud you for the great work you're doing and for your listening well thank you and and it is a prayer that it's done <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you thank you so much Julie um, let us move on to the second question and then we'll take some more of your comments. So be thinking about what you would like to respond and perhaps a follow-on question that you'd like to ask Michael. But now I'm gonna ask him to look at the second question in this visioning process in, in order to go a little more in depth because I think at least when you, when you answered the first one, Michael, I got some new perspectives on visioning <clears throat> that I hadn't necessarily thought of before. So this is very helpful. The second question is, I love this question. <laughs> How much power can I flow through my life? Can ah, I comment on that? How much power? I think that we have, um, unconsciously we have inhibitors. We inhibit ourselves um, uh, from power. And of course, we're not talking of force and domination or manipulation. We're talking about the real power of the spirit to express through us. Now the, the uh, nuances of that question uh, have us bump into areas of ourselves where we're playing small, play, places within ourselves where we're not allowing our fullness to come forward. Some, in some cases we are um, holding hands with um, uh, uh, mediocrity. We are a part of the conspiracy for mediocrity. There's actually a conspiracy for mediocrity. It's unconscious in this conspiracy for mediocrity uh, basically is in alignment with the status quo. Whatever the status quo is, that's the conspiracy for mediocrity because as infinite beings, we're always emerging into greater aspects of ourself. And so one of the uh, 
things that people have an unconscious fear around is uh, being uh, is jealousy and envy. People do not want uh, uh, to be an object of either one of those things. So uh, jealousy is 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 an affirming quality, meaning a person wants what you want. Uh, envy is they don't want you to have what you want, and so people become afraid of being the object of those things. So they'll play small not to step out, so to speak, because unconsciously we know, or even consciously we know that if we succeed in our life, we will be talked about. If we fail, we'll be ridiculed. So in, in, this, in the conspiracy of mediocrity, you can't win in the human condition. If you win, you're talked about. If you lose, you're ridiculed. So once you get over the fact that you're not, uh, you're allowing power to come through you and it's not for people, in that way, it's actually a contract you have with your soul to become uh, the uh, distributor of your gifts, talents, and capacities. Then you move through life with more resist, with less resistance, because you're not playing for the audience. You're not here to pe please the people. You're here to be of service. And when uh, ridicule or jealousy or envy raise their head, it, 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 you're not in, you're not in that domain so it, it has less effect on you don't really care because you're more in tune with the gift that's trying to come through you the talent that's being cultivated and and your willingness as we've heard from the first two speakers tonight uh to first two participants you get so involved in what is yours to do and how you're going to do it and what you have to grow to be to do it that you don't care about the ridicule or the envy or the jealousy or people thinking you're crazy or who does she think she is to do this? All you know is you have something to do. You're going to cultivate the power. How much power can I allow to flow through me? Obviously, it's infinite. But when you ask the question, now you're setting yourself up for it to flow through you. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, um, I just wanted to make a comment here that when, well, Michael, you know how many opportunities for projects come through ag and office, which, and ultimately land in my court. Right. And a really good way that I found to make a discerning decision <clears throat> is to ask myself the question, is this work that wants to come into the world now with or without me? And mm -hmm. if the answer is yes, I just get on board because I know it's a done deal. Right. And I'm going to give whatever I can to it, right? So that's a little workaround that I figured out, and it works about 110% of the time. <clears throat> so how I'm going to ask attendees if they would like to answer this question and speak with Michael. How much power can I flow through my life? Just close your eyes for a minute and just try to listen to the expression, the ear behind your ear. It may not be an answer as you know it, but it's something that's coming through that wants to inform you. So just take a minute and then raise your hand and I'll bring you onto the screen. Oh, looks like we have an answer from Stephen Pope. Go ahead. Well, now you made me all nervous saying it was an answer. Um, <laughs> the, the comment, it would be that discernment is difficult and can take a lot of time. And, and in my practice, which is Quakerism, we, we say it's, it's, you know, it can take your whole life to figure out what you're here to do or what of the many tasks you see around you are yours. You know, there's the, the famous Shaker Fuging tune that says, it's a gift to be simple, it's a gift to be free, it's a gift to come down where you ought to be. So the idea of, of using discernment and having to have sometimes complicated processes that may involve silence and may involve talking and may involve whatever, but this issue of discerning what is yours to do, 
my, I don't have an answer. I just want to say, yeah, that's the big ticket. Once you figure that out, you can be as clear of purpose as you are, Barbara, when you mentioned you figure out and then you just get everything out of the way that's necessary to do it. Right. And I think discernment is something we grow into. As you're indicating, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entire life of growing into the power of being able to discern, discern what's real, to discern what's merely our perception, to discern facts from truth, uh, and, and, and to discern what we are to give. As Howard Thurman likes to say, it takes, it takes a long time to walk with God. And, and so that's why we call this a practice, whether it's the silence of Quakerism and the, the movement that comes up for people to speak, whether it's the life visioning process or mindfulness, I think what we're talking about here is not a quick fix. It's not, you know, four steps to enlightenment. <laughs> you know, we're talking about a way of living. And so we stay on the, what I call the discerning edge. We're always, a, we become available so that even in a moment where we're not specifically meditating or specifically being still, insights can creep in like an aha moment. You know, but where did that aha moment come from? You know, it, it may have had its genesis in a question that we ask or a moment of stillness or silence that's now invading the, uh, our, our life. So I, I'm, a, I'm in agreement that the sermon is a, a discerning edge that we're, we're, we're growing into that uh, I think every year with practice becomes more and more refined. It just becomes more and more refined. And as we mature, we notice that oftentimes we find we have talents and gifts that we took for granted, resources that we took for granted that now come into play, or we find that there are gifts and talents that we had to cultivate in order to uh, move into the next iteration of our expression. But I, I, I like the word discernment. Mm. Yeah, it, it reminds me, um, last week, Michael and I were up with ag and in Sacramento, California, for a week of meetings. And one of our um, leadership council members is Jim Blake, who's the CEO of Unity World Headquarters. And we were talking about tasks, and he's very helpful, and um, Unity has a lot of resources. And so um, I kept sort of putting tasks on his list to deliver when he went home and got to work. And then all of a sudden I realized that maybe I was being a little unfair because he's got a big job already. And I said, gosh, I'm so sorry. You already, I'm sure you already have plenty to do. And he just looked at me and said, it's all right. I'm infinite. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that question, how much power can I flow through my life? If it's not me who's flowing the power, if it's really spirit and allness flowing the power, then why would I even think in terms of limiting that power? It isn't mine in the first place. Right. So I really enjoyed that. Right. Sometimes it reminds me of the question or the statement, if you want something to get done, find a busy person and ask them to do it. <laughs> because some kind of way they have the capacity to increase their ability to allow more power to come through because there's no apathy or lethargy there. But if you find a person that's lazy and ask them to do something, they don't have the power of the game <laughs> to actually get the thing done. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We, we, we do have um, Sherry Sorbo who'd like to talk with us for a minute, and then we'll move on to the next question. So Sherry, I'm putting you here on the screen. Are you here with us? I am. Hi, Reverend Mike. Hi, Sherry. So good to see you always. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's really interesting because I, I just wanted, when you were talking about um, once we get over that, that feeling of people or you can't do this or who do you think you are, all those things, it hit me that um, through the visioning process and the deaf ministry, which I'm so happy to see every Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you, and then you said, as we mature, we find there are gifts and talents that we cultivate. Yes. And I realized that there was a maturity for me, you know, how much power 
can I flow through my life? Visioning for that deaf ministry was so powerful. But I wasn't big enough to hold it all. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was a maturity part that I had to go through. So, um, yeah, you had, to, you, had to, you had to ripen a little bit. I, I did. I did. I'm finally ripe. I'm finally ripe. <laughs> <laughs> so, just, think, just think now because of that seed idea, how many people I know. have direct experience with the message on a regular basis? I know. People, I love it. People you'll never meet. You'll I, never. I know. Yeah. They, have, they, have no, they have no idea you had anything to do with it, exactly. but it's feeding all of those people because somewhere within you said yes, mm -hmm. and with the, the power that you allowed to flow through you at that time, something came into fruition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so now there's something bigger with ministry and, you know, with, with my doctorate and my ministry now that um, I, it came from the foundation of the deaf ministry, so... You know, I just wanted to share that, 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 that crystallization of maturity yes. that comes through at the same time that, you know, when you spoke about Howard Thurman, it's like, it takes a long time to walk with God. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you, Sherry. That's, Thank that's, you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. And you built upon that success. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I talk about it every yeah. time somebody, yeah. say, somebody says they want to do something. I always say, have you vision for it? Have right. You for it. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Well, let's, let's have, let's take these next two questions together. And you just free associate for a minute and share your wisdom about them. And then we'll ask if anyone would like to also answer the question or make a comment. And these two questions are related to each other. What do I need to do to empower my life? And what gifts, <clears throat> excuse me, do I have to give to the world? Mm -hmm. So what do I need and what do I have to give? Um, needs and resources, we hear this a lot. So how does that pertain to life visioning in its fullest expression? What, what do I need to empower my life is a, an awareness question it becomes a, a, what I call the growing edge. There are areas in our life where we have to develop. I, I always say things like, um, you can't have what you're not going to become in consciousness. So when we ask the question, what is it do I need to empower my life? I'm actually asking, where do I need to grow in my own life? What areas uh, need to be healed? What areas uh, need to be fleshed out? Um, what areas do I need to grow in? Again, all of this is happening within one's own consciousness so that the change takes place within and I become, I become available to insights around that area. Now, the, now, I'll come back to that, but the next question is very important for a couple of reasons. You know, what gifts do I have to share? Now, this is important because we want to move in the world from the consciousness of being and having, not from the consciousness of scarcity. So if I ask, what is it that I already have? that can be in service to the vision, what gifts do I have already, that I, my vibration is having rather than neediness. And as the, the, the old law says, you know, to he or she who has more shall be given, and to he or she who has not, even that which they have shall be taken away. That's not a personal law, law. that's just, if you walk in the feeling tone of having, you generate the capacity to receive more, if you walk in the feeling tone of not having or scarcity, you scare away the good. So by saying, uh, what gifts do I have? Now I'm in a space of having and being, and I radiate into my life more resources, more things that will um, uh, em em empower my life. So many people place their attention on what they don't have. and 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 what's not working, and that becomes their predominant frequency. By saying, what gifts do I have already? And honoring that gift and appreciating that gift, now I'm walking in the frequency of having, and more shall be given me. It's law, it's vibrational law. Yeah. Uh-oh, you're muted for some reason. 
The simple reason being I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's ask some of our participants on this call to just go within for a moment to gather your thoughts. Think about, really get into this question, what do I need to do to empower my life? And what gifts do I already have to give to the world? See if what Reverend Michael just said seems to uh, change your understanding of your needs and your already existing gifts. So just take a moment and raise your hand because it's fun to talk with you. I'm enjoying this format very much. And then I'll ask someone to come on screen with us. Wonderful. Oh, I see an old friend here, Linda Watson. Linda, come, come and talk with us. I'm bringing you onto the screen now. <laughs> hey, Linda. Hi there. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Reverend Michael. Linda, I'm glad you tuned in because I was just talking about you with somebody and I was going to reach out and, and call you. So you, here we are. <laughs> Here we are. Well, I was going to reach out and call you too. So perfect. And Barbara, your lovely presence is a blessing, of course. And, you know, this visioning process is something I've done with you, Reverend Michael, for over 30 years. And um, these particular two questions in the process are extremely um, profound for me. <clears throat> because what I've noticed for myself and others is that very often people aren't, um, they're self-effacing and, and they're not always aware of their gifts or they don't want to bring them forward or there's some idea about what that would mean if I said I was talented and gifted and said, and my favorite, favorite quote and definition of calling and vocation <clears throat> is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Yes. And that is uh, Fred, Frederick Buchner, a theologian, if I'm saying his name properly. <clears throat> First time I ever read that, I thought, yes, when there's that connection between what we have to give, what I have to give, and what the world needs. And I remember the moment I knew what that was for me when I heard Mother Teresa's quote, which is, the world shall be healed one heart at a time. Yes. And I knew my work as a practitioner was sitting with one heart at a time. And, you know, whereas your Dharma, Reverend Michael, is reaching throngs of people and speaking, and, and, you know, you also sit with one person at a time. But I knew that was my Dharma and my work and what I had to give. So what I, what I work with and what I help others do is to identify their strengths, their skills, their gifts, and <clears throat> encourage them to, and, and reflect back to them, which is what we do as practitioners, beholding someone's wholeness and reflect mm -hmm. it back to them so they might be encouraged to be that and, and do all of that. Absolutely. Well, I think you've... Um you become a great example of the answer to those questions. And the person that I was speaking with about you a few days ago was Dr. Lawrence Carter. Oh. <laughs> and he was asking about you because he has such uh, fond memories of the great transformation he was going through when he came through Agape and began to understand new thought and began to imprint that at Morehouse College. And he was very thankful that I had practitioners such as Linda Watson that were around him, uh, ass assisting him and guiding him back to himself. And so I said, oh, I'll have to reach out to Linda, let her know that. And you, so here we are today, uh, speaking. <sighs> wow, I just love that. It's such a good synchronicity, and I love Dr. Carter. Thanks, Linda. I'm going to take you off the screen. Love you. Love you, Linda. <clears throat> Call me. <laughs> Great. So... There's one more question here, and I mean, it's 
this there's it's a multifaceted question um, pertaining not just to the visioning process itself, but maybe some wisdom here um, about the nature of habit and comfort zone and mm. accustomed ways of being that um, may be um, safe for us to follow, but don't really lead to that um, sort of breakthrough at the edge of chaos that requires right. new information into the system. Right. And so the question is, what habits do I need to change to become the person I'm being called to become? Yes. Maybe some comments on that. Absolutely. Again, um, it's, an, it's a question that allows us to look at our life. And as you indicated, there, there is no comfort in the comfort zone. That, that's a, that's, that, that the comfort zone is just a zone of um, kind of going unconscious with compulsive behaviors, uh, habits that mask safety and security but actually create a level of stagnation that ultimately will, will provide the context for emergencies and crisis to occur because the universe is progressive. Our soul wants to unfold and we are here to consciously participate in our own unfolding. So if, if we do not look at those habits or thoughts or perceptions, uh, eventually a level of stagnation will occur and it will show up in other areas of our life. As a, as, a, as, a, as a crisis, so to speak. So <clears throat> by asking the question, and, and we, it's radical honesty, because you're doing this process in your own awareness. This is not a group process, even though you may do it in a group. It's within your own consciousness. You start to look at yourself, and you see the habits. And sometimes the habit is simply a, a repetitive conversation that doesn't serve with, with, with certain friends. It's just keeps you boxed in to your limited perception. Sometimes it's an actual physical habit. But when you look at it and you notice that that's what it is, just observing it begins to change its texture. As we all know uh, from the scientific method that whatever it is you observe is changed on a subatomic level just based on observation. So if you begin to observe yourself with intention to grow, now you've placed the observer effect on steroids. You not only are observing habits, conversations, points of view, but you have an intention to grow. It starts to shift all of that on a subatomic level, making it easier for you to actually make a change in your life. Sometimes the change is to stop something. Sometimes the change is to engage in something new. Um, but eventually as you engage in something new, uh, inertia gives way to momentum and change starts to happen more and more rapidly. But, but, I, but I, think it's, I think it's a very important question because people oftentimes do not examine how they're using their habits. Now, habits are good in one level because it creates a level of system consistency, allows you to get things done. But on the other level, they can, be, um, uh, they can crush the spirit, particularly if they've emerged from a fear and developed into a compul compulsive behavior or defense mechanism. Yeah, I think that's a very important observation that it's like um, the power of intention. That if you, if you don't actually separate yourself long enough to look at the habit or set an intention that's larger for um, a larger behavior or an evolutionary behavior, coming from your own life. If, if you don't stand back and create a self-consciousness of that situation, there's no way that there's going to be any response from the universe or from your own self. Right. So what I'd really like to do now um, is ask people just to take a moment and consider the question, what habits do I need to change to become the person I'm being called to become? And the reason that that I'd like you to get over your shyness and participate here is, for one thing, remember this is really not about you. This is about the fact that anything that you're willing to share is probably going to resonate with many other people on the call. And yeah. that will give us the opportunity 
to take a closer look at that particular scenario. So let's go inside and when you're ready, please raise your hand. Well, here's an old friend. I'm going to ask Mansoor Vakili, who is a friend and colleague of mine, to come on the screen and, and, and respond to this question. What habits do I need to change to become the person I am being called to become? And Mansoor has one of the most active minds I have ever encountered. And so this should be an interesting meeting of the minds. I'm bringing Mansoor onto the screen. Hello, Mansoor. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. And I enjoyed your uh, comments and your great uh, gathering, basically. And I'm learning as I'm listening. Outstanding. I was just, I've been thinking and actually practicing that there is a deeper simplicity in the system that as long as, because of our actually Earth as a living system, mm -hmm. is trying to manage us and self-organize us, especially at the time that now everything becoming chaos and all that, so that's the emergence of new consciousness that is coming. But at the same time, it's true or a self-conscious process that human being went through. We became self-conscious. We created this linear model and then really a linear relationship on base of domination, short-term gain, and uh, self-assertiveness and liability management. And, we, and through that mind and model, we created all kind of activities like economic politics, uh, politics and uh, social structure and all this too. And all we need to do is just change the relationship, linear relationship that is based on domination and uh, self-assertiveness to nonlinear and uh, holistic uh, 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 relationship, which is based on cooperation, partnership, the way that our body works and makes it so easy that I can talk, which is a very complex thing without any effort. So basically that simplicity applies to the whole world too. All we need to do is just change those relationships. And when you do that, universe is connecting us and guiding us to do what is our destiny. And all we need to do, just change the relationship. And that's, that's all we need to do. Mm -hmm. and that's all can I can add. <laughs> no, thank you, Mansoor. Let's, let's hear what Michael has to say about that, because I know he's very interested in this topic. Oh, yeah, well, he's covered uh, a, a lot of material there <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the statement of all we have to do is. But he covered uh, the earth being a conscious being, uh, and, and, and that's true. The earth is more and more conscious. The vibration of the planet is raised at a much higher frequency. It's never been brighter or more conscious at any time in human history. Scientists are even telling us, of course, that the frequency of the earth is raising every single year. So whether you're looking at it from a scientific point of view or from a shamanistic point of view or a mystical point of view, everything you're saying is true. And this, this, this movement of emergence, which is coming from chaos, the, 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 the old uh, frequency that led us into linear thinking and subject object uh, uh, perception is being broken down. So what appears to be, um, what appears to be turbulence and chaos is, is actually that which is decadent, decadence, not in cadence with that which is seeking to emerge, is, being, is falling apart. And that which is in cadence with the next level of our unfoldment is beginning to poke its head through. And so for those who are on the spiritual path who are, have powers of discernment, uh, powers of, of bright seeing or seeing that we're at a powerful time. We've all heard the statement, um, the, 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 the bigger the light, the bigger the shadow, that um, the light is so bright 
that we can actually see the decadence a lot easier. So the idea is to stay out of anxiety, out, out of anxiousness, out of fear, out of projecting worst case scenarios onto the screen of the future and, and be available uh, to allow for the best of us to rise up that's in each of us to actually participate in history making, not merely observing history, but actually participate in the, the um, conscious participation in our own unfoldment individually, but a conscious participation in the own unfoldment collectively, because humanity is not at its best when it's doing singular, solitary, individual transformation, which is important. Humanity is at its best when we're using our moments of transformation to change the four corners of the world and to actually bring about the new systems that are trying to emerge, which are more divine and more human rather than the domination, manipulation, and control model based on scarcity, based on lack, rather than uh, on abundance that we're all living in. So uh, I concur with Mansoor. Yeah, it's kind of hard not to from a 30,000 mile perspective, isn't it? Yeah. Mansoor, thank you. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to put you back in the queue, but I'm glad that you shared that. We're coming to a, a close. Um, Michael, is there anything that after we're done, you're going to say to yourself, oh, I wish I would have said. <laughs> Probably a lot. I, I just think I just want to mention to people that, you know, we have the possibility, no, we have the mandate to actually participate in our own unfolding. And we're not to just be bystanders of history or be bystanders of what's going on in the world, but actually participate in our own unfolding through visioning and finding what we're called to do. Uh, this, this, is, this is our moment. And I think, as you said to me, do I, if I wish I would have said something when we get off the phone, uh, off the Zoom, people are going to say to themselves when they leave their body, you know, wow. I could have really shared this. I really could have activated this. I really could have given this. But instead, I was scared. I was afraid of what people would say about me, and I did nothing. I stayed in the, the comfort zone. And so I just implore people to ask the right questions, uh, be available to the answers, and um, watch as this life, life is always for itself. It never compromises, never contradicts itself, never works against itself. And we are life. And life is becoming more conscious of itself as us. So if we participate, we have more life to give, more life to live. Ecstasy and bliss are the function of the activation of potential. We can actually live in bliss. And so um, I think that's all I have to say. Let's, let's, let's uh, participate in our own unfolding with a, a sense of relish and enthusiasm. I'm loving that. One of my favorite... Um quotes is from a Catholic mystic called um, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon. Mm -hmm. And the quote is, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. Yes. And it's such a simple statement, but you can unpack it every which way. And it just fills you with the force of that light. Absolutely. So I'm very grateful to you that you took the time to be with us today. The recording's going to be available to everyone who is here, everyone who is not able to be with us in live time. Um, your website, agapelive.com and michaelbernardbeckwith.com. Everyone, please go visit because there's lots of wisdom and offerings to be found there. And our next meeting of this particular forum is on October 29th with Dr. David Goldberg, who is the editor and publisher of Science of Mind magazine. So I hope to see many of you back here then. Thank you so mm. much, Michael. Thank you, Barbara. Always, you always do a great job. It's always good talking with you. Yeah. And it's been my joy to be with all of these people who are tuning in right now and in the future in the archive. <laughs> great. Thanks again. See you soon. Bye-bye.